Hi everyone, um, I'm making a video to explain um, some tips and tricks for the Cambridge Proficiency Listening uh, paper as part of the CPE, the Cambridge Proficiency exam. What I'll do is um, we will do the listening exercises together and then I'll show you uh, how to go about learning how to learn a strategy which will help you improve your listening uh, performance on this particular exam and improve your listening skills in general. Okay, so in part one of the CPE, you'll be given three of these. That is, uh, so six in total, two, 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 in which you're given multiple choice questions. It's always A, B, C. And you need to listen closely to what you hear in order to find the right answer. So take a moment, pause the video, and read through the questions. And what is this about? Well, you, will, you hear a science lecturer talking to students about the sense of taste. Okay, take a moment, read through the questions. Now, you've done that, I will read the audio script in my best Cambridge voice. Um, listen closely, you'll hear it twice, and see if you can't guess, uh, make an informed choice as to which answer is correct. All right. Beep. The received wisdom used to be that there were four tastes and that each was perceived at a specific location on the tongue. Sweet tastes at the tip, salty and then sour along the sides, and bitter at the back. This so-called tongue map was based on some rudimentary research, originally done in 1901, and then later misinterpreted. But these assumptions went unchallenged for a staggering 73 years, until a researcher called Virginia Collings proved that, in fact, every part of the tongue has receptors for every basic taste, including umami, a fifth taste, which most Western scientists ignored until relatively recently. Why textbooks should persist in printing this so-called map is quite beyond me, frankly. It certainly baffled me back when I was a kid at school. I could never get the experiment right in science class, and I, f I failed for insisting that I could taste sugar at the back of my mouth. Goes to show, you shouldn't always take for granted what your textbook or your teachers tell you. In fact, the remarkable thing about our sense of taste is just how little is known about it. Beep. Now, my advice is to uh, rewind this video and play the text again. You will always have a chance during the CPE to hear everything twice. So listen again. I'm not going to read it again. You can just play it back and then we'll move on. Okay. Now we're ready to look for the answers. Now when I teach this live in class, um, we I give everyone the script. That is, uh, yeah, I show everyone what they just heard. So you see the text and, oops, sorry, <laughs> spoiler, you see the text in front of you here. Okay, now again, reviewing the questions, how does the lecturer feel? So what Cambridge is basically asking here is that you are able to infer tone or feeling on the part of the speaker based on, well, tone of voice, but also vocabulary. Um, I'm going to give you the answer and show you where you would find this in the text. All right, the answer is A. The lecturer was surprised that this tongue map as a concept was accepted for so long. Now, where do we find the answer in the text? Hmm. Aha, here it is. 
Why textbooks should persist in printing this so-called map is quite beyond me, frankly. Now, basically what you're looking for, actually you're listening for, uh, but this technique also applies to the reading part of the CPE as well. Um, the, that is the reading use of English, the reading texts. Basically, when someone says that something is beyond them, what's beyond me, why, what they're expecting is um, surprise or astonishment or, yeah. So they were surprised that it was, that it was persisted in being printed for so long. Okay. The answer to number two is, why did the lecturer refer to his own experience as a school child? Because he wanted to encourage his students to trust their own judgment. Now again, if we look back at the text, to encourage students to trust their own judgment. Aha. Uh -huh. Here the speaker says, it goes to show you shouldn't always take for granted what your textbook or your teachers tell you. Now this is another way of saying, trust your own judgment, right? So again, what you're looking, what you're listening for, because we're working on listening skills, um, is vocabulary that is similar, or synonyms essentially, to what you see in the answer. Okay, so surprise and encouraging someone to trust their own judgment. Again, with take for granted. That's telling someone, it's another way of saying, trust your own judgment, right? Let's try another one. Okay, this is a bit more of an in-depth um, exercise uh, because here the task is to complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. So generally you won't be writing more than three words here, maybe four. <clears throat> you will hear part of a lecture, that's my Cambridge voice, about ancient Egyptian ships and an attempt to reconstruct one. Now you have one minute to read the questions. Let's do this together. Archaeologists believe that the site called Mersa Gavassus was once a on the Red Sea. To gain the support from the the pharaoh Hatshepsut imported incense by ship. <clears throat> Ancient Egyptian shipbuilders differed from modern ones in that they did not make a for the ship they were building. The speaker compares building an ancient Egyptian ship to doing a wood from trees grown in was used in the reconstruction of the ship. The modern shipbuilders were provided with a by the archaeologists. The modern shipbuilders used to make the ship watertight. The modern team used a to get the ship to the sea. Now let's learn a strategy. First of all, in number seven, my question, I would always ask my students preparing for CPE or learning to improve their listening skills is, what kind of a word do you need in number seven? Look at the context and the words around it. If you have an article, uh, a lid word, a, the, an, what kind of a word will you need here? That's right. A noun, a, a, th a person, a place, a thing, an idea, you need a noun. Similarly, in number eight, you'll need a noun. Now this is called, the strategy is known as prediction. So what could we predict might be the answer here? Hmm. The site was once a on the Red Sea. Well, I don't know, uh, uh, a, mm, a dock, a, um, a port. What about here? To gain the support from the, hmm, the pharaoh imported incense by ship. So what kind of word or idea could go in the gap? Who do you gain support from? Well, to gain the support from the government, uh, the ministers, you know, probably people, right? 
Again, here in number nine, you're going to need a thing. How do you know that? Because you have an article. In number 10 as well, an article, a definite, uh, an indefinite article, a something. And here, wood from trees grown in, this would probably be a location, right? A noun. The modern shipbuilders used something to make the ship watertight, and they used a something to get the ship to the sea. All right, what I'm going to do is read this in my best pronunciation and see if you can um, fill in the blanks as we go. And keep in mind, everyone, spelling counts. Beep. We know that the ancient Egyptians built ships, but until recently, people thought these were just for river transport. For example, the remains of an elegant wooden ship, 4,500 years old, were found by the Great Pyramid, but this wouldn't have been strong enough to go out to sea. However, archaeologists working at the desert site of Mersogoasis on the shores of the Red Sea, about 160 kilometers from the famous temples of Luxor, have recently started uncovering amazing artifacts, things like stone anchors and planks of wood that were once part of ships, and they now believe this was the site of a harbor from where ships sailed down the Red Sea. They believe the ships were sent out by Hatshepsut, a woman who ruled over Egypt 3,500 years ago. She already had a strong army, but to retain her power as pharaoh, she had to have the backing of the priests. And one way of getting this was to provide them with the incense they burned during religious ceremonies. This wasn't available in Egypt, so she had it brought in by ship. Support for this theory comes from carvings made at the time of sailing ships with their crew, sails, and cargo, all shown in amazing detail. So a team attempted to reconstruct one of these ships uh, to find out whether it actually could carry out a sea voyage. They started by examining both the remains of the river ship and the carvings of Hatshepsut's ships to find out as much as they could about the design of the ships. They were surprised to find that while modern shipbuilders start by constructing a framework and then build the ship round it, the ancient Egyptian shipbuilders didn't do this. Instead, the planks of wood which formed the outside of the ship were carefully shaped so that they all fitted together. Constructing the whole thing out of so many differently shaped pieces of wood must have been rather like trying to solve a puzzle, but on a huge scale, and without knowing if there was actually a solution or not. This was true for both the river ships and for seagoing ships, but in other ways there were differences in their construction. For example, the pieces of wood on the river ship had holes in at regular intervals, not for nails as in modern ships, but for ropes to add more support and keep the planks from coming apart. But there was no evidence of this on the carvings of the sea-going ships. Instead, they relied solely on wooden joints. Reconstruction of the ship required massive pieces of wood. Egypt has never been a great place to find giant trees, and the pharaohs used cedar trunks imported from Lebanon. But today, the cedars of Lebanon are rare so the timber was imported from France, from 150-year-old Douglas fir trees. The actual building of the ship was carried out by the Lahma family, several brothers who run a shipyard in Egypt and have a lot of experience with modern wooden ships. Rather than the archaeologists providing them with a written two-dimensional plan, they provided the brothers with a model of what was required. No one's built a ship like this for 3,000 years, but the Lahma brothers were able to understand the way it all fitted together and translate this to the real thing. Once the ship was built, one problem remained. There were still cracks between the planks of wood, which would mean that it'd leak when it was floated on water. Modern wooden ships use epoxy resin, but that wasn't available 3,000 years ago so they decided to use beeswax instead.
They knew the ancient Egyptians were familiar with this and that they used it on their furniture. So finally the ship was ready. The inscriptions on the carvings had said that the seafaring ships were constructed on the River Nile and that they were taken apart again plank by plank and carried across the desert to the Red Sea by donkey. But the research team decided to cheat a little here, and instead of dismantling the ship, they loaded the entire thing onto a truck and drove it there. So at last they were ready to launch the ship, but they'd no idea how. Beep. <laughs> okay, there's our text. Now, what you want to do is rewind this video and listen to the text again. Do that now. Beep. Okay. Now, you've had a chance to listen to the listening extract twice. What we now need to figure out, aha, uh -huh, by looking at the script is what the answers are. And again, the strategy is the same as before. We're looking for synonyms. So in number seven, the question reads, archeologists believe that the site called Mersogoasis was once a on the Red Sea. Okay, now we know that this is going to be a location, a thing, a place, right? And here the, the text reads, they now believe, who is they? Archeologists. They now believe this was the site of a harbor from where ships sailed down the Red Sea. So the site, that is Mersa Gavasis, uh -huh, was a harbor. And that's the answer to number seven. Do you see what Cambridge <laughs> does here? It's tricky. You hear the words Mersa Gavasis, or you hear the word site, right? So automatically your ears are pricked up and you're listening closely. But then you have this whole what is it, 30 words in between before you actually get to the answer. That's part of the challenge with CPE listening. You have to really listen closely and focus uh, consistently. Now here, again, if we look for synonyms to gain the support. So we're looking for what is Hatshepsut, what did Hatshepsut have to do to gain support? Now when you hear it, they will not say the word support. That would make it too easy. This is the highest level of English that's tested. So what's another way of saying Hatshepsut needed to get support? Ah, backing. To have backing is another way of saying to get support. And who provided the backing? She needed the, the backing from the priests. So the answer to number eight is the priests. Okay, what I'm going to do is skip um, to, well, let's go here. Um, okay, let's try number 13. The modern shipbuilders were provided with a by the archaeologists. Now we know it's going to be somewhere in here, right? Aha, uh -huh, okay, a team attempted to reconstruct. They started by examining the carvings to find out as much as they could about the design. They, who? The modern shipbuilders, were surprised to find that while modern shipbuilders start by constructing a framework and then build the ship around it, the ancient shipbuilders didn't do this. Hmm. So the modern shipbuilders were provided with a what by the archeologists? Well, they were provided with a, the planks of wood, constructing the whole thing. Um, ah, okay, constructing a framework. So here, the modern shipbuilders were provided with a framework. And then, what did they use to make the ship watertight? That is, the modern uh, shipbuilders. Let's see where it is. Um, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I made a mistake. Here's the answer to number 
13, they were provided with a by the archaeologists. There we go. The archaeologists provided them with a two-dimensional plan. They provided the brothers with a model. Okay, so the answer should be, ah, model. 14, I'll show you these answers again in just a moment. Beeswax. Now, some of you might have written in number 14 that they used resin or epoxy resin to make the ship watertight. But again, this is tricky because, why is that not the answer? Um, let's see if we can find it. Ah, yeah. Modern ships use epoxy resin, but that wasn't available. Again, you have to listen consistently and closely. So they, that's the modern shipbuilders, decided to use beeswax instead because that's what the ancient Egyptians used. All right. So 13 is, uh, sorry, 14 is beeswax. I think you're, st I'm hoping that you're starting to see a pattern here, that you're looking for synonyms. The speaker compares building a ship to doing a, let's see if we can find the answer. Aha, and here it was. They, of course, the answers come in order, which is nice. It makes it a little bit easier. Planks of wood fitted together. Constructing the whole thing out of so many differently shaped pieces of wood must have been rather like trying to solve a puzzle. So again, the speaker compares building a, the ancient ship to doing a puzzle. Solving a puzzle, doing a puzzle. Okay, I'm not going to read to you anymore. <laughs> um, oh, here are the answers. Pause the video and make sure that um, you understand why these answers are the answers. If you're not sure, then go back to the script and find the answers. And this way you train your brain for both listening and reading. Now let's do just one more, a short one. Okay, this is a part of the CPE that students quite often find difficult because they hear the same five speakers twice. So speaker one in both cases this is, he says the same things. So 21 and 26, it's the same text out loud. 22 and 27, it's the same text that you hear. But each time you're listening for different information. Here you're listening for why each speaker read the book. Here you're listening for each speaker's opinion of the book. Now let's just practice one together. And of course, in CPE, you will have time. You now have one minute to read the questions. So read through. If there are words you don't understand, don't worry about them too much yet. See if you can make an educated guess. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to read speaker one. Here we go and see if you can figure out why speaker one read the book from these options and why what was speaker one's opinion of the book from these options. Speaker one. I decided it was something I ought to know more about. I had some recollections of that period, but I was very young then, and I wanted to find out more about what was going on then. My parents and relatives, that generation, talked about a lot of things, but I didn't really engage with it all then. I was too young. I picked it from a list I found on a website because it looked as if it wouldn't be dull. And that was right. It was lively and very accessible and not at all dry. It made the events and changes of that period come to life. Okay, now pause the video, rewind it, and play it back. And you'll be looking for the answer to 21 <clears throat> and 26. And without further ado, okay, here is what you just heard. Now, what are the answers to 21 and 26? 21 is H, 26 is B. The question is why. 21 H, the speaker read the book because of an interest in the subject, and they thought it was very entertaining. Well, where is that in the text? Oh, it was something I ought to know more about. Um, I wanted to find out more. That's another way of saying they had an interest in the subject. 
But where does the speaker say that it was entertaining? Ah, it was lively and very accessible. It made the events and changes come to life. Another way of saying it was entertaining. So now give it a go yourself. Um, train your brain. Here you can read through the script. So this will be 22 and 27, 23 and 28, um, 24 and 29, and then 25 and 30. Give it a try. And if you get an answer wrong, you can look back in the script and figure out what the answer is. And in the end, take a moment, calculate your score. How many answers did you have correct? Divide that number into the total number of questions, and then you find out the percentage. If you had at least 60% correct, this means you passed. However, keep in mind that you needn't pass each part of the CPE. You will get an average mark listening, speaking, reading use of English, and writing. However, it's wise to try to do as best you can on each individual part. Now, I do hope this walkthrough has helped, and thanks for watching and listening.